Welcome back to another episode of the Rock and Royal Podcast, the podcast for those who rock the Y on the pitch, on the field, on the court, and beyond. And number 22, BYU. Yes, I didn't mispronounce that, guys. BYU back in the top 25 for the first time in two years, a little over two years. Um, heads to Baylor Saturday. That's a 10 a.m. Mountain Time kickoff on FS1 on the banks of the Brazos at McLean Stadium in Waco, Texas. And I thought I would turn the mic over a little bit to a guy who knows Baylor, quite frankly, a lot better than I do. And I would hope he does because that is his full-time job. Um, but Zach Smith from the Waco Tribune has uh, graciously decided to join me. I really do appreciate it. And Zach, thanks so much for spending a couple minutes with me and letting BYU fans get to know a little bit about this Bears team. Man, what an intro. That's great. Um, I uh, Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to talk some Baylor football. I'm sure we'll get into it here, but I, we're, we're everybody in Waco is still trying to collect themselves after last week's Hail Mary, but um, I think we've recovered a little bit here and uh, <laughs> looking forward to another stiff challenge against BYU. I thought about jumping in here with uh, to to break down Austin FC's upcoming match this weekend <laughs> against Real Salt Lake, but I thought that might bore a lot of our college football devoted listeners. So we'll stay we'll stay away from Los Verde, uh, if you will. Although I understand you've got a lot of hot takes about the Verde right now. I so. mean, it's hot. It's definitely flaming. Uh, it might be more of a dumpster fire than anything, but uh, you know, <laughs> I won't get into that. Hey. I was I was around BYU football during the 2017 season, so I know a thing or two about dumpster fires. I I can understand <laughs> that. Uh, BYU fans will agree with me on that one, so that's not too hot of a take right there. But uh, BYU four and zero for the first time since 2022. Like I mentioned, back in the top 25, and Baylor had very similar preseason expectations as this BYU team. They were both picked right in the 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 fringe double digit range in the big 12 preseason media poll BYU very clearly uh, overachieved. I think we can say in the first four games of the year. And when you look at the record, you look at the numbers, you might actually think that Baylor has in some ways as well. I mean, I think that win about a week or so ago over air force kind of opened a lot of eyes in particular with this offense and coming off of a pretty disappointing loss at Utah uh, you thought, okay, maybe that's just Utah's defense doing Utah's defense things. It was a conference game that doesn't actually count as a conference game because it pretty a contract and that kind of thing. They needed to rebound, and and I thought they rebounded very well against Air Force. And honestly, Zach, for about three quarters against Colorado, I thought they rebounded pretty well as well. What happened late in that game? Obviously, we've I think we've all seen the highlights at this point. We've at least seen the... Um, Two attempts at a Hail Mary. One of them finally connects for Shader Sanders and the Buffs walk away with that overtime win. But what kind of happened down the stretch, do you think, where I feel like if if Baylor upsets, can we say upset? I think that would have been an upset officially. Uh, if they upset Colorado, we're probably having a very different conversation about this BYU game, right? Oh, absolutely. And they and they they had every like you know, they had they were playing some of their best football for the first you know, really 50 minutes of that game. They were, you know, they, they started strong. They had, they were playing well in all three phases. Um, quarterback Sawyer Robertson threw an absolute dime to one of his receivers that only his receiver could catch in the, in the fourth quarter to give the, give Baylor an event, like a, a lead for a moment, right? When they were losing some momentum, they kind of grabbed the momentum back and kind of retook that lead late. And then it was just, you know, I don't want to say it was a bad play call. Um, you know, it wasn't I, – I, you understand kind of what Dave Aranda and the coaching staff was trying to do on that last Hail Mary. You know, um, I understand why they were rushing as many players as they did, and they didn't have a lot of players back, and one of the cornerbacks fell down in front of the – so there was just like a, a, like a bunch of errors, things that just – weren't necessarily bad decisions. It just things kind of fell really, 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 really the wrong way for the Bears. So um, I, I wouldn't 
I'm not as like hyperbolic about that game and, and say that it's like some sort of big collapse or anything because they played so well, like I said, for so long. And it was just kind of a really, really good play by Shadur Sanders and just kind of, uh, kind of a fluky ending. Um, so, you know, yes, it, I think it left Baylor stunned. It left Baylor heartbroken, but um, they're, they're by no means done. They're no means, you know, going to just kind of roll over and let BYU walk all over them. So, you know, yeah, it hurt. And I think that there's definitely going to be some sort of um, kind of working your way out of that. But um, <laughs> this is not a team that is going to just, like I said, lay down and let BYU walk all over them. No, for sure. And and they're two and two on the season, I think, for a reason. If they were coming into this game at three and one, um, you you almost might feel pretty good about this Baylor team with the home field advantage, with the um with kind of the pride the the pride of a three and one start in a year that was, at least from an outside perspective, kind of um Putting Dave Aranda, I think, a little bit on notice. He made the change to 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 uh, move back to be the full time defensive play caller um, of this team, and I I feel like that's already proven some very good fruits as well. Two and two has a little bit I, I mentioned before a little bit of a different feel to it around this Baylor team, but I'm with you. I don't I don't feel like this Baylor squad is totally. I don't feel like they've been outmatched in any of the games that they that they've played so far, and maybe these words will come back and and totally bite me in the butt. But like I saw some really good things out of that Air Force game. Again, maybe Air Force isn't as as great of an opponent as as uh, as they've been in the past, but a thirty one to three win over the Falcons is pretty impressive to me. And the way they played, in particularly against. Uh, in Salt Lake City against the Utes okay. after Cam Rising got hurt. Now, Utah fans will say that was because Cam Rising left and the offense was discombobulated, and maybe there's some truth there. Isaac Wilson getting his first real minutes, uh, strong minutes of the season. And, but I, I thought that Baylor team responded very well. I thought defensively they were very good after that Cam Rising in, um, injury and whatnot. And so there were bits and pieces – of good to take from even from these two losses on the season where you realize this Baylor team isn't going to be um, kind of the, the bottom of the conference team that maybe a lot of people expected at Big 12 preseason media days um, in a lot of ways. It's also a Baylor team that has a lot of, a lot of, I almost said shared history, but it's not a lengthy <laughs> shared history. And yet for for as light as their shared history is, I feel like BYU and Baylor have a deep, a deep one. There's there's almost like a connection hmm. as of the two private religious schools in the Big 12 conference. I know there's technically a third religious school, but they barely count anymore. They're trying to disaffiliate <laughs> themselves from the church. We won't get into that for the sake of Bears fans out there, but Baylor very proud Baptist University, BYU, obviously the flagship of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, and there there was almost like this instant connection when the two became conference mates of like just sharing ideas or sometimes resources or uh, like it just an exchange of of conservative academic thought, I think mm. was one of the one of the pamphlets I saw put out um, is. When I went when I went to Waco a couple of years ago, when BYU was ushered into the conference, I I just got this feeling of like Baylor kind of appreciating BYU being in the league with them. Is there still a little bit of a feeling like that around this university? Do you think? Oh yeah, I, I think that Baylor, yeah, Baylor and BYU are kind of kindred spirits in that regard. There, I know there's a lot of um, shared people on the on the coaching staff, and I and I obviously the we. Uh, Campbell and Clark Barrington transferred to Baylor ahead of last season. And Campbell is still here and has talked very highly of, of BYU and his time there. And, and I think that there's, you know, in a spot in, in college football, like college football is where money flows freely. And, you know, you know, sometimes one big donor can take over a school and kind of 
transform it, right? You know, um, or, or or one big region like Texas Tech and oil country and all of that. Um, schools like Baylor and BYU still kind of that they're definitely in the NIL and they're still kind of looking ahead to the future of college football and what it's like, but they're still that you know, they're grounded in some way. And I think that being a private school, being a religious affiliated school, I think that that definitely, you know, contributes to that factor. And, and, you know, yeah. So, you know, and, and, you know, (laughs) they're both, they're always traditionally good teams. BYU is a very good team and Baylor, at least, you know, until recently has been a very good team. So that, they always, no matter what the situation they're in, are going to produce some good football players and some good football teams. So, yeah, I definitely think they are. They're they're connected and they're they're kind of kindred spirits in that regard. Uh, a lot of it also goes back to the coaching staff. You touched on it some there. Baylor's Dave Aranda grew up in a lot of ways in his college football career on the uh, in the Beehive State. He was a defensive coordinator at Southern Utah. And then he was a defensive coordinator at Utah State under Gary Anderson, who took him to Wisconsin in 2013 as well. Um, uh, Gary now a defensive analyst on the BYU staff, kind of a defensive line specialist in there, working with his longtime friend Kalani Satake from their Utah days. Uh, Jay Hill, the defensive coordinator, was also on that staff. Sione Pua, the defensive tackles coach, also on that staff. Um, They're basically just rebuilding a lot of their old Utah roots at BYU uh, in some ways. Also on that Utah State staff, though, uh, that I forget to mention was sometimes was uh, BYU offensive line coach TJ Woods, who spent, I think it was two years, at, or no, a year, about a year and a half at Utah State uh, with Dave Aranda, with Gary Anderson, and then he went to Wisconsin with the duo for two seasons as well. So there's a decent amount of overlap um, and I know because of that, there's a there's a lot of respect between head coach Kalani Satake and Baylor's Dave Aranda in some ways. I know Coach Aranda, we touched on it some there, entered the season on a his I don't want to say fully on the hot seat, but his seat was warming up in some ways. And and that led to some some staff shakeups, some reorganizations. He took back play calling duties on the defensive side of the ball. That's worked out pretty well. Do you feel like that seat is still, again, not blazing hot necessarily, but maybe a little bit of warm where these Bears need to get some results in order to kind of make Coach Aranda feel like he's a little bit more more firm on his in his footing? For sure. I, without a doubt, he is certainly still on the hot seat. And he knows that, and he's been very kind of, you know, sometimes he's a little bit too honest, in my opinion. Um with about everything and and he's been very upfront with you know how he feels about his job and what he's doing and you know and he's he came at the end of last year when they finished with three wins um he had this four point plan you know really that was like i'm going to change this 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 and this and this is how we're going to get to where we want to be you know and you're starting to see and so that was the whole story going through the spring into the fall was kind of the shift in vibe from Jay, Dave Aranda, who is a very uh, thoughtful person. He was a psychology major. He's a very soft-spoken kind of introverted. He's not what you think of when you think of a football coach. And so you've seen this shift in vibe. He brought in Jake Spavital as his new offensive coordinator, who was a he coached Johnny Manziel. He was a you know uh, the head coach at Texas State down here. Uh, they shifted their practices from the from the evenings to the early early mornings. You know they they are changing their offense. Like you mentioned, he took over the defensive kind of play calling, and he's pretty much the defensive coordinator at this point. So, you know, yes, Dave Aranda is the head coach, and he still is the head coach. But the the program this year looks completely different than it did last year, and I think because of some of those changes and because of some of those. Uh, point by point plans that he laid out and is now kind of uh, you can see the the momentum going you can see things rolling and so yes well his seat is definitely hot I don't think it's as hot as kind of people outside of Waco realize right like I don't I think it would be it would have shocked me you know I, I would be shocked if he was fired midseason you know if, if they make a bowl game I think he's almost guaranteed coming back you know, and as much as this last week has been hard and this Colorado game has been hard, you know, at least the Baylor administration, the Baylor team, the Baylor coaching staff still believe in him. 
And so uh, I don't think his 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 seat is definitely warm, but it's not he's not going to he's not imminently going to be fired. I think that's actually really important because that uh, you're right that that is a little bit of the feeling outside of Waco is is maybe Dave Miranda has a hotter seat than it actually is. But but you said it. I mean, he he sounds like he's got the support of the administration. His athletic director absolutely loves him. And again, people outside of Baylor, college football coaches, industry insiders, uh, other administrators, they all rave about Dave Miranda. Like everybody that comes in contact with him absolutely loves him, man. Um, and so if anybody deserves a long leash, I think it's Aranda who does have a little bit of that soft spoken mentality. Um, but it's also led to, I think a very good culture that he's installed in a Baylor program that needed a cultural change when he got there. I think he's laid the foundation for it very well. Uh, there have been some hiccups here and there, both on the field and off mm -hmm. the field, but the off field hiccups have been a lot less since he got there. Um, and I think he's got to be given a lot of credit for some of that as well. And um, I think that there's a lot of momentum, you know, recruiting wise, like this, this is, you know, there are, there are people that have been covering Baylor a lot longer than I have in Waco that say that they have never seen recruiting momentum uh, from a football perspective, like they have this off season and then really this year. And I think if you get rid of a random now and you get rid of some of, I, definitely some of the coaching staff is going to follow him wherever he goes because they love him. Um, and I think you're going to lose some of those recruits and, you know, that's, that's how you build your program. You can, you can, you know, fill it with the transfer portal as he's, you know, kind of done, but you know, that's, that's also still a really big piece of this. And right now he and this coaching staff have tons and tons and tons of recruiting momentum. Well, Let's get into some of those, some of the personnel there uh, a little bit because you you did mention you can Baylor has been a place that's been more picking from the transfer portal rather than outright, you know, recruiting from it, dumping from it, uh, if you will. They have they have found a couple of spots to fill in their roster um, in transfers, but they have also been focusing a lot on the high school recruits, development, that kind of thing. Again, very similar to how BYU has been. I know they've got a bunch of We've got a couple of transfers whose name jump off the page, um, but they are still primarily a high school recruiting team and a development focused team. And I think you're seeing that with most of their impact players, even right now, um, when they have like a Juco transfer at, at quarterback and, and other positions like that. But uh, one of those transfers for Baylor, you touched on him a little bit because of his performance in Colorado, uh, was the quarterback for against the Buffs. Um, Sawyer, uh, Sawyer Robertson, Sawyer Robertson. I almost said Sawyer Robinson. I'm like, so that's that a very common honest. mistake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sawyer Robertson. Thank yeah. you for not allowing me for, for helping me that, uh, threw for 148 yards and two touchdowns against the bus also ran for a team by 82 yards and mm -hmm. a score. So he showed off some, some of the, some dual threat capabilities that he hasn't been able to show. Since I think arriving in Waco, is he kind of the guy moving forward? Because I know there's been a little bit of a quarterback battle uh, with the Bears for the, you know, through fall camp and and even into the first couple weeks of the season. Did Sawyer? He's he's one of those transfer guys, Mississippi State transfer, mm -hmm. been in the system now for a little over a year. Did he show enough to be the full time guy going forward? Do you think? I think so. Like Dave Dave Aranda did not. You know, he's not going to name a starter officially, you know, Sawyer and, you know, another transfer to Quan Finn are still listed as or on the, uh, on the depth chart. Um, but Sawyer has really kind of, he started the last two games to Quan Finn started the first two games. Uh, and then he injured his shoulder in the, uh, the loss at Utah. Uh, but Sawyer came in and looked really sharp against air force. You know, I think he completed 80% of his passes and threw for a career high, 250 some odd yards, I want to say, uh, rushed for another touchdown in there. And he has really grabbed a hold of this starting quarterback job. And he is not letting Daquan or letting Dave Aranda make the decision to bench him. Uh, when da Daquan was, Daquan Finn was one of the highest rated uh, transfer portal quarterbacks. He was a dual threat guy, he started for three years at Toledo. He was the MAC MVP last year. So he has the chops to lead a team. 
And so he kind of came in as the savior, so to speak. Like he was going to help write this ship. He was going to be the guy. And then, you know, through spring and through fall, Sawyer kept battling and he never let Daquan out of his sights. And that, that battle was so close up until day one against Tarleton state, the, an FCS team where they started the season. And so I think now we are seeing exactly why that was so close. I think the coaching staff really expected Daquan Finn to come in, grab the QB one role and run with it. And he didn't. And Sawyer never let him out of his sights, like I said. And so Sawyer has been playing out of this world the last two weeks. And that's kind of like last two weeks, Baylor has scored 31 points in back-to-back games. They didn't do that one time last year, you know, and and so um, part of that, there's a lot of reasons why that would be, but, you know, the team believes in Sawyer, he believes in himself, and, you know, he is the guy moving forward. And that's, you know, I still think Daquan Finn has a role to play on this team, but yes, it is Sawyer's team moving forward. It, it sounds a little bit like what BYU got when they brought in former Baylor starter Gary Wilhannon from the transfer mm-hmm. portal uh, via South Florida, obviously, this time. Uh, maybe expecting him to be a little bit of that guy or to come in and to really go and ball out and prove that he was that guy. And I think Gary did to an extent through spring ball and, and even into fall training camp. It was a neck-and-neck neck battle right until the very end of training camp. Um, but the incumbent, Jake Retzlaff, also wouldn't let Gary get – kind of out of his sights and and i think that competition made them a lot better um to where coaches almost felt like they sort of had to go with jake in some ways uh sawyer robertson kind of feels like a little bit of that same story in some ways it feels like very similar paths very similar stories um again between byu and baylor and it seems like sawyer also has a trust of this offense as well Mm. particularly his receivers i saw a couple guys against in that colorado game i'm i'm watching it kind of intermittently a little bit i'll i'll fully admit but i saw a couple of guys just make some incredible catches against the bus who are some of those wide receivers that really impress you the most and and that maybe byu fans should take note of well one of the the guy who probably made the most insane catch one of the best catches i've seen a Baylor wide receiver make it over last two seasons was Monterey Baldwin. Um, he's number four. He's a senior. He's, he led the team in receiving last year and he laid out, I think in, in the second quarter there, uh, you know, and he just, he, he has freakish speed. I think he had, uh, he was 98 speed in the new video game when that came out, you know, he's been on Bruce Feldman from the athletics, his freaks list back to back years just for his speed alone. And uh, he really showed it off there. And so he's, very quickly turning into a, a hot target for Sawyer. Um, another guy, Hal Presley. Um, you know, there was a there was a touchdown catch. He had a touchdown catch in the fourth quarter when Baylor was kind of losing momentum. Um, you know, and, and and Colorado was coming back. The offense, Baylor's offense, kind of stalled. Sawyer threw a pinpoint pass where only Hal Presley could catch it. And uh, you know, I was talking to Hal Presley yesterday. And I, I said, Sawyer, he threw a pretty good pass to you there in the fourth quarter. He's, he looks at me, he's like, pretty good. He's That was better than pretty good. So um, I think there's really a connection between those two. So those are two receivers that I think can have a massive impact. And that I would say that the Baylor receiving room is the deepest on the team. So I could go very deep, but those are probably the top two. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll, uh, well, we'll cut off there, I guess. Otherwise, we might be here for five for another five or six hours and you've got stuff to do. I don't want to keep you away from actually covering a very exciting barely Baylor team right now. You've got a lot to, uh, to get in there as well. But Zach, what I really wanted to uh, bring you on this podcast and kind of introduce you to our readers over at KSL.com and in the KSL platforms um, was uh, I wanted to do some hard hitting journalism with you, Mm. some capital J journalism, Waco and Provo. I feel um, have a little bit of similar vibes to them in some ways where they're they're not small towns anymore, but I definitely want to call either one a big city. They're centered around their universities in, in many ways. And I know there's Magnolia Street and Dr. Pepper people might think otherwise uh, um, for Waco. And, and Provo certainly has things to do outside of BYU, but the two, the two universities kind of play a, a fairly central role there. Um, if Saturday's game is anything like the last time BYU went to Baylor, um, 
I think there will probably be a lot of BYU fans that show up. There could be a decent amount of blue in stands. BYU fans travel very well. There are a lot of BYU fans in Texas in general. Um, and not all of them got into the game at SMU in Dallas, ironically. So they may be looking at this as an opportunity to maybe score some tickets to see their team a little bit closer to home. Um, but in the city of Waco, now it's going to be an 11 a.m. kickoff. So I don't know if there will be too much to do before the game. Obviously, that's that's so early that you're maybe talking about finding a good place for a breakfast burrito and then charging into the stadium. Uh, but BYU fans are also unique where – they do want to experience a little bit of that, of that hashtag nightlife. Um, <laughs> but most of them also probably aren't going to go out and, and party and with certain uh, substances of in bribery, shall we say. Um, what what would you suggest as a local to the area? Uh, you and your wife now live in Waco, mm -hmm. I, I understand. So what would you suggest for a BYU fan who's traveling to Baylor to kind of see, to do, maybe a place to go eat after the game? Um, or, or just, or just, well, what do, what do they, what do they need to do before they leave Waco and, and take advantage of this trip? Well, you mentioned Magnolia and that, that like you can do that once and you, you can spend 20 minutes in there and you're probably good enough. So I wouldn't necessarily say Magnolia, um, Cameron park, uh, is really, really cool. It's right down along the Brazos and, you know, there's plenty of walking trails and paths and stuff. And it's definitely not the mountains like in Utah, but. Um, there's some cool paths back there and just kind of walk around. I don't think it's supposed to be deathly hot. So that, that'd be okay. There's a Cameron park zoo is a very, it's a top tier zoo. Like for a town, the size of Waco, the Cameron park zoo is amazing. You know, I think they just got a penguin exhibit too. So it's, it's pretty cool to check out. Um, as far as food, like Waco does have some pretty good food. And if you want something like before the game or, you know, a lunch, uh, Schmaltz's, Schmaltz's Sandwich Shop is pretty good. Um, the one downtown I don't believe is open on Saturdays. It's only open on Fridays, but there's another one that's not too far away that's open until I think four or something on Saturdays. Um, and then you've also, you know, I was just in Salt Lake a few weeks ago and you certainly do have some barbecue, but it's not like here. And so there's no, a couple, no, no, there's a couple places to go. Um, guest barbecue is pretty good, but it's not my favorite spot. Uh, their sandwiches are okay, but I like to get just kind of the meat on a plate with some, you know, some, uh, you know, potato salad or whatever. Oh, yeah. uh, my place to go for that would be Terry Black's and that's right downtown. It's probably going to be a little bit more expensive than you want, but it's worth it. It's, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of a once in a lifetime thing. If you're not from Texas, you get some brisket, get some coleslaw and do your thing there. So. Uh, I would say Terry Blacks. And then if you want to go someplace, you know, after the game, um, I would recommend a place that's called George's. You know, it's it's across the uh, freeway from from the stadium, but it's been in Waco since the 20s. And it's an awesome, like, it's a bar, and it's got, you know, burgers and sandwiches and stuff like that. They're known for the Big O, which is like a Philly cheesesteak kind of thing. Um, but their onion rings are the best that I have ever had. And it is, you know, that if you want to go to a place that's quintessential Waco, go to George's and, and you won't be disappointed. So hopefully that covers all your bases. Yeah. Like I could go on for food and stuff to do forever. That's my favorite thing to talk about. So the George's for post game, mm -hmm. uh, head, head up Terry Black's for good barbecue Yep, um, right there. Maybe barbecue on the way in or, or barbecue on the way out if you really want. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. I think anytime, anytime you're in the heart of Texas, like central Texas, you have to find the right barbecue place. And Terry Black's is the one in, in Waco then. To, and if, to and if, you know, I, I, real salt Lake apparently plays in Austin that night on Saturday night. So any fans that are going to make that trip, there are Austin is a far better barbecue spot as uh, I lived in Austin for six years before I come into, for, before coming to Waco. So there's if you want better barbecue, Waco people stop listening now. Um, it's in Austin, but Terry Black's is is pretty good. What's what's your top uh, what's your top barbecue place out around Q2 Stadium? If if anybody's trying to make the BYU RSL doubleheader, the closest one that is worth it is it's called Interstellar, and it's it's it, it's I've heard a, of this. I've yeah, heard of Interstellar. It's, it's in a uh, it's in a bit of a strip mall in one of the suburbs to the north, but um, it's kind of on the way and it's, 
you're going to wait in line, but again, and you're going to spend more than you want, but it is, yeah, it's worth it. It's life changing. It's a life changing meal. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's, but get there early because they yeah. run out pretty quick. Okay. So Interstellar and in Austin, Harry Black's in Waco, um, or just go pick up a burger and onion rings from George's after the game. There you go. Uh, either way, and you can't go too wrong. Um, also, unless you're a huge, unless you're a massive fan of Chip and Joanna, maybe avoid Magnolia Street because if you've been there once, you've been there a thousand times. And it, you didn't say overrated, but I'm hearing a little bit overrated. Well, here. you know, and, and I'm, I guess I'm not the target market for that. Like my wife loves it, but also she watches that channel. She watches Magnolia Network all the time, right? And doing all the fixer uppers and all that stuff. And, you know, even like she was like, she went. I think she got a cookbook, maybe a candle, you know, and she's like, all right, like, cool. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like it was cool. Like she's glad she did it, but you know, whatever. So uh, I don't, they, they do a lot of stuff with Baylor and I know they've given a lot of money and they've, you know, you know, pumped a lot of money and interest into Waco. So I can't really fault them for that, but uh, it is a little bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a tourist trap if you can call one. Yeah, for no. um, I, I, uh, yeah, I think that's that's probably that's probably pretty accurate. I'm a Chip and Joanna guy. I mean, I fix her up all day, every day. But um, yeah, if you've been there once, you've probably been there enough for like 20 visits. It is, pretty it is definitely, it is definitely more for tourists and for locals as well. So um, I can only understand. I can only imagine how your wife feels being a yeah. fan of that show and having the chance to go there every day. She probably doesn't go there every day, even as a fan of the show. Definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Zach Smith from the Waco Tribune. Uh, what's the best way for uh, BYU fans that maybe want a good feel for this Baylor football team to to follow you to support your work and to check out what you're what you're writing about what and what you're covering with this Bears program? Yeah, follow me on Twitter or x or whatever it's called now by zach smith at by zach smith that's my twitter i tweet out pretty much every story there and read out uh read us at wacotrib.com so we've got plenty of coverage you know all week every week it's, it's around the clock so yeah zach smith from the waco tribune he covers baylor he uh he's also a longtime austin resident so he's He's a little bit of an outsider on the beat, uh, which I think is a good thing. I think it's a good thing. Mm. WacoTrib.com is website by at by Zach Smith uh, on. We're gonna keep calling it Twitter. I just it's can't Twitter. do this. X I'm calling. I can't Twitter. do it. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry, Elon. I can't do it. Uh, at by Zach Smith on X. Zach, thanks so much for joining me. Really do appreciate it, man. Uh, really appreciate you giving a little bit of local flavor to BYU fans and maybe making the making the trek to Waco. And uh, I'm sure we'll both see plenty of them on Saturday. Happy to do it. Thanks for having me. Look, uh, looking forward to the game. Hey, look you good, bro. I'm about to hit up bread. Man, them Utah State Aggies, man, they just some pets. Catching something in Vegas, you can place your bet. Coach G up on our side, so we never pressed. Praying meetings every day, so we never stress. Rockin' Royal, Rockin' Navy. Uh, know you with me, let's get it, baby. Rockin' Royal, Rockin' Navy. Uh, know you with me, let's get it, baby.